No que nos transformamos? Em criaturas modificadas? In what have we transformed? In modified creatures? Upon not being empathetic to the other person's pain. When the avoidable death becomes normalized, when we do not want to recognize ourselves as a small portion of a whole called planet Earth, when our minds and hearts are guided by the accumulation of wealth and identify enemies to be fought off and eliminated. Can we consider still that we exist, that we still exist? Those are some of the changes or the motivations rather that provoked us into carrying out this seminar, this international seminar, the Brazilian tragedy, risk for the common household. In behalf of the organizations and, the, and collective groups organizing this event, I'd like to greet all who are watching us, both on the webinar as well as on the social networks, the National Council of Churches, the Brazilian Commission of Justice and Peace, the Service Ecumenic Secretariat, the Deacon Association, the Ecumenic Forum Arte Brasil, Agaoni Sinos, CNBB, with the social uh, bishops, and, uh, the, and this is the organizing members of the seminar that mobilized as a group effort in order for us to be able to, he, to be here with guests, both national and international ones, to speak about this tragedy or these crimes, these Brazilian crimes, rather. We have a lot of support to host this event. I have the support of ZERC, the Action and Dialogue Platform, PAD, CRB, Ripa Brazil, the Evangelic uh, Front for the Rule of Law, and we have the transmission, we have the Resistentes channel. So we are many joined together in a virtual way to talk about this, to talk about the Brazilian tragedy and to ask ourselves if it is or not a risk to the common cause. It is important to highlight that from today on uh, to May the 6th, always starting at 10 to 12.30 Brazilian time, we'll be gathered to deepen the analysis of the current Brazilian situation uh, under the light of the pandemic and measure the impacts of the fundamentalism towards democracy, economy, the social biodiversity, and the health crisis. We want to understand what are the risks and if the current framework may or may not represent a risk for the planet as a whole or common house. This seminar is uh, ecumenic. And it has some fundamental pillars as such, such as interdependency. We're nothing without one another. We're not, we're nothing without the biodiversity, the international internationalism. We join together in our cultural differences, this dialogue and the commitment with the lives of all living beings. Today we'll have, we're very grateful for the presence of our guest, Mr. Olivier de Schutte, that I will introduce shortly. And right after we have a song that will be presented by Ed Carlos Galvão from Itacoatiara. Uh, uh, 
he will sing for us the lament of Amazon. And we have the second round table, which is time and democracy, the risks for the common home with Bishop Marines. And finally, the time and market threats of the fundamentalisms that will be coordinated by Reverend Sonia Gomez Mota. So with that, let's start perhaps, well, even perhaps we we'll start another fundamental information. The seminar is, is being uh, interpreted. We have interpretation, Portuguese, English, Portuguese, and we are guiding the people who are on the webinar. When someone is speaking Portuguese or English and you don't understand one of the languages, please click on the small globe uh, on the toolbar to access translation. And on YouTube, the Brazilian Commission of, of Justice and Peace, you can follow the seminar with the interpretation in the social networks. That unfortunately is not possible. So we want to start this first round table that we call, well, the opening table, introducing our special guest, Mr. O Olivia de Schutter, the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on, Pover on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights since May 2020. He was a member of the Economic and Cultural Rights in the United Nations between 2015 and 2020. He was the rapporteur, the special rapporteur of the United Nations on the right to f for food, or right to food access between 2008 and 2014. And here in Brazil, he has followed all issues with rega uh, regards to the bill of the uh, expenses ceiling. Uh, and one of the, this is one of the reasons that uh, explained the current process of deepening of inequalities and that impacts directly on the COVID-19 pandemic. So Olivier, welcome among us. We are very grateful for you to have, for you having accepted this invitation in the next 20 minutes. We will hear you quite attentively. So when we have five minutes left, I will let you know, okay? You have the floor. Well, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And it's a, a great pleasure for me to be with you and to express my, my solidarity with the concerns that um, you are expressing around the degradation of social rights in Brazil and the threat this means uh, to our common house. That's a beautiful title for this, for this seminar. Now, Romy, as you mentioned, I would like to focus my remarks on what was really a, a warning signal that was given when the National Congress adopted Constitutional Amendment number 95 on 15th of December 2016, freezing the level of social expenses under the um, Brazilian constitution. This is a gesture from Brazil that uh, raised very serious concerns throughout the United Nations human rights system. And the reason is that constitutional amendment number 95 is typically a, a, a deliberately retrogressive measure since it impedes the progressive realization of rights in areas such as healthcare, education, social security. Um, let me focus on healthcare, for example, because of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is probably the social right that is most subject to violations today. Well, in Brazil, with a population that is growing, with a rising demand for healthcare, an aging population that demands more healthcare, the 20 years freeze on social expenses imposed under Constitutional Amendment 95 means in fact, according to some calculations, a 25% reduction in healthcare in comparison to what a normal increase commensurate to needs 
would have implied. So when we speak about a freeze imposed by constitutional amendment number 95, in fact, as the demand for public services grows with population growth, with the aging of the population, it in fact means a reduction. And it is a reduction that is per definition disproportionate because the freeze is permanent rather than a short term measure in response to an immediate crisis. And therefore, Constitutional Amendment 95 raised many concerns. We wrote to the Brazilian government on uh, the 8th of December 2016 with the, with the hope of avoiding this situation. We had a follow-up letter on 23rd of December 2016. We received answers in March 2017 from the government. And let me explain the content of the debate we had with the Brazilian government following that exchange. First, the government alleged in its response provided in March 2017 that freezing for 20 years social expenses would stimulate growth and employment. That is a lie. The reality is that austerity leads to decelerate economic recovery, making it more difficult to achieve economic recovery and making it extremely expensive in terms of growth, in terms of increased unemployment, in terms, of course, of the reduced provision of public services. In fact, social protection and public services are a way to stimulate, to strengthen the economy, and certainly not to allow it to grow better. The second argument that was presented to us by the Brazilian government was that this 20 years freeze on social services, on social expenses, introduced by Constitutional Amendment 95 was gradual and therefore could allow to um, avoid stronger shock therapies in the short term. In fact, however, a 20 years freeze is a very radical measure that does not take into account changes in circumstances and is an entirely disproportionate answer to a temporary budgetary crisis, liquidity crisis within the Brazilian um, government in 2016. And we see this with the pandemic today, how um, badly equipped the hospitals are, how um, many gaps exist in the Brazilian social protection system. And we are now paying the price with this enormous crisis in Brazil. We are paying the price with 400 thousand people who are dying from COVID, who died from COVID in Brazil, are paying the price for this immaturity in anticipating potential crisis in the future. Thirdly, the answer we got from the Brazilian government was to say that reducing um, these social expenses or freezing them at their 2016 level would not worsen inequalities because the Brazilian government noted that public spending in the past had actually maintained existing inequalities. The reality, however, is that as social expenses are frozen, as they're not allowed to increase, this will mean very serious impacts on low-income households, on women, on unemployment. On low-income households, because research from the International Monetary Fund, for example, shows that a reduction of 1% in public spending means an increase of 1.5 or 2% in the Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality. Indeed, the less you spend on public services, the more difficult it will be for low-income households, for poor families, to achieve a decent standard of living. As regards women, we have studies from the Institute for Social Economic Studies in Brazil that show that as a result of Constitutional Amendment 95, the expenditures specifically benefiting women were reduced by 58%. And as we know, when public services retreat, when they are scaled down, it is women who traditionally shoulder the burden because they are the ones who have to take care of the children, the elderly, the sick, those in other terms whom social services cannot provide for in times of austerity. 
And thirdly, yes, these, uh, this 20 years freezing of social expenses um, has increased unemployment and shall continue to worsen the employment situation in Brazil. We know from various economic studies that 1% um, contraction of the public revenue of the state, 1% reduction of the um, um, investment the state makes in the economy leads within two years to a 0.5% increase in unemployment. Moreover, it is striking to me that there were many alternatives to the passing of this Constitutional Amendment 95. Brazil could have chosen to impose greater progressivity in taxation, including by introducing a wealth tax to reduce the very high levels of inequality. It's a shame that Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world and has one of the most regressive fiscal systems in the world. You have a beautiful constitution. Article 153, paragraph 7, speaks about imposto sobre grandes fortunas, right? It speaks about taxing wealth and having a progressive system of taxation in place. In fact, imposing such a tax on wealth could allow to raise some 100 billion US dollars per year. The property taxes today in Brazil are about 4.5% of all tax revenues, which is very low in comparison to the average OECD countries where the normal um, uh, contribution of property taxes to public revenues is about 10%. In Brazil, again, it is 4.5%. So Brazil has a very inequitable fiscal system, has a very regressive taxation system. It also has, and I studied this very closely when I was special rapporteur on the right to food for the UN, it has a very inequitable organization of the agricultural sector. 300 million hectares of productive farmland, 35% of the national territory, um, bring about only 0.06% of Brazilians tax revenue. Um, because the rural territorial tax is extremely low. And this, in my view, is a violation of 100, Article 153 of the Constitution, that so little contribution is provided to public revenue by the big landowners, the big um, fazenderos. Moreover, the agricultural subsidies worsen inequalities. According to one calculation I made a few years ago, 9% of the farms, the largest faziendas, capture 70% of the subsidies. In other terms, the bigger the farm is, the more subsidies it captures. So Brazil could have done much differently. Rather than freezing the level of social expenses, it could have increased the public revenue from um, uh, the wealth tax, from the property tax, from taxing agricultural land in order to reduce inequalities in your beautiful country. The government could also have done something else. It could have combated tax evasion. In 2016, when this calculation was made, it was estimated that tax evasion cost Brazil 80 billion US dollars per year. 80, 80 billion. That is um, much more than the fiscal deficit of 2016, that was about 50, 50 billion US dollars that year. And in that sense, you could say that in 2016, Brazil was not facing a spending crisis, it was facing a revenue crisis. Yes, it should have increased public revenue to finance whatever public services, social protection, social rights the state must provide and guarantee to its citizens, but it should not have been allowed to use the pretext of this revenue crisis to make the poor pay further for um, the austerity measures introduced back then. So let me perhaps close with um, a greeting to Brazilian civil society, to the social movements, to the indigenous peoples, the Colombolas, to the women's groups and to the unions in Brazil.
we in the United Nations human rights system are looking with great concern at the evolution of the country. We believe it is a shame that Brazil has been taking this direction over the past five, six years. And we are extremely troubled that Brazil, already one of the most unequal societies on the planet, is going to see its situation worsen further with the COVID-19 pandemic. What you are trying to do is to reverse this situation, reverse indeed Constitutional Amendment 95, and I know this is difficult. Some even say this is impossible. As Frigif Nansen has said, however, the difficult is that which can be done at once immediately. The impossible is that which takes a little bit longer. Many thanks. Nós agradecemos profundamente. We thank you deeply, Olivier, for bringing us this very concrete analysis because the impacts are felt by us every day in our country through the, fra the fragility and the lack of support to social policies, especially public health, our unified public health system, and public education, both at the basic level and university level. And I think you used a very simple and accessible language to bring forth questions that are very interesting especially the fact that our biggest problem is not expenses, but revenue. So the Brazilian state needs to have bigger revenue because it already spends too little. And with this aggressive neoliberal pol policies, we see the people who already receive many subsidies from the government are receiving more and more while people in social and economic vulnerability are not able to access public resources, including the example of our emergency aid during the pandemic. The value of this aid is insulting to Brazilians it's 250 reais, which is able to purchase, which is not able to, to purchase anything. So Brazil made another choice. And we will take advantage of these minutes that we have. If anyone in the chat box wants to ask Olivier a question, you may you may ask him a question. And I think he didn't use all of his 20 minutes. So I think we can we can have at least one or two questions if anyone wants to ask him a question. And then you can write down your question in the chat box. We have a few comments from Father Dario. He said the analysis was very important and we need this external vision and this demonstration of support to the problems we have already identified here in the country. And the question is, the UN has mechanisms to, does the UN have mechanisms to make Brazil review its social and economic policy? And then, Olivier, you can please answer the question. Does the UN have mechanisms to make Brazil review its social and economic policy? Thank you for this question. Um, of course, in the UN, there are various bodies that can 
monitor what is done by different countries, including Brazil. And one most important body in this regard is the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on which I had the honor of, um, of sitting between 2015 and 2020. And I understand that the um, review of Brazil will take place in just a few months time based on the report that the country has submitted to this body that monitors the development of economic, social and cultural rights um, in, in the country. I would encourage you to seize this opportunity to send to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights information about the situation of social rights in Brazil in order to ensure that the government um, will have to answer the, the pertinent questions that you can provide given that you have a deep knowledge of the developments on the ground. I would say um, that there is also another tool which is to use the special procedures of the Human Rights Council, these independent experts that can write to the government and um, request from the government that it explains certain choices based on the communications received. In my role as Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, I can do two things. I can write to the Brazilian government based on the information I receive from NGOs, uh, unions, uh, civil society groups working in the country, provided it's first-hand reliable information I can check, I can then communicate with the Brazilian government and request that the Brazilian government provides explanations, I can also travel to the country and report back then to Geneva, to the Human Rights Council about what I've seen in Brazil based on the report from my visit to Brazil. For this, however, and I did this when I was special rapporteur on the right to food, I came to Brazil in 2009. At the time, this was the government of Lula da Silva and I had an, a very good exchange with uh, the government of Brazil at the time on the issue of the right to food. I could return to Brazil. However, for this, the government would need to invite me um, and to accept to engage in this dialogue with the United Nations human rights system. Unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic that the government would agree to this. But of course, you may wish to pressure the government to send out an invitation to me if I were to receive such an invitation, I would immediately uh, travel to Brasilia and make myself available to report on Brazil. Muito obrigado, Olivier. Thank you so much, Olivier. While you are answering, we have received several questions, but unfortunately, we won't have time because we have two other panels. And I think that many of the answers were given while he was speaking. And many of the questions will be important in our next discussions in this seminar. So, we apologize to the people who asked the questions, but unfortunately, we will need to conclude this very important points made by Olivier. And I would like Olivier to take a few seconds to make his final comments, and then we will move on to our next section, session. Well, thank you for having me on this uh, seminar. I think it's extremely important that um, there is international solidarity around the very deep crisis that Brazil is going through. Um, unfortunately, we are in very difficult times where some governments are tempted to hide their incompetence and their inability to support the population by um, scapegoating certain groups in the population and resorting to, 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 to demagoguery and, and populism. And I, I very much hope that this is not what is happening in Brazil today, uh, but uh, please do count on the UN human rights system to continue to monitor very closely what is happening in Brazil. And please be assured that we will react very swiftly to any information you provide us with. Many thanks and good luck in your important work.
Muito obrigada, Olivier. Obrigada também Thank por Thank you so much, Olivier. Thanks again for the guidance provided and we are very happy that you accepted our invitation. Since our seminar is an ecumenical seminar, we need to have our spiritual moments. And one of the characteristics of the ecumenical movement in this context of the pandemic is to grieve for the lives lost, not only due to the pandemic, but to the violence that has intensified violence against women, against the LGBTIQ plus population, against Quilombola peoples, and the street population, police violence. So the 407,000 deaths due to COVID are just a part, a portion of the daily deaths we have in our country. And because of this, in the month of April, we held an inter-religious protest, a thousand candles for a life, which was promoted by Respira Brasil and that advocates for a vaccine for all, oxygen for all, and the impeachment of our president Bolsonaro or any neoliberal government. And for this interreligious act, we counted with the creativity, creativity of Ed Gomes, who is from our Itaquachara group, and he composed a specific song for this moment in the A Thousand Candles for Life protest. And the name of the song is Lamento da Amazon, the Amazon's Lament. And it is one of the regions most impacted by COVID-19. So Ed, please introduce us this song. Olá. Não sei se me ouvem bem. Hello, I don't know if you can hear me. Our internet here is not very good. Even though we pay high fees, our connection is not very good, but we persist and we keep on participating. So let's do it. Que agora congelou, Ed. I think we lost we lost connection, Ed. Gente tá chorando enquanto a Amazônia vai queimando para boiada ir passando em nome do tal crescimento. Pois desde o sul até o norte numa política de morte de domínio e exploração seu moço eu digo mesmo que cresceu muita gente já morreu na defesa desse chão seu moço eu digo mesmo que cresceu Muita gente já morreu Na defesa desse chão O nosso mundo agoniza sufocado Na política do descaso Quanta gente agonizando Não consegue respirar Meu Deus do céu Por que tanta indiferença? Os que negam a ciência não se importam em cuidar. Ah, como é triste, grande fio em hospitais, na TV e nos jornais. 
o mundo inteiro pôde ver A passos lentos A vacina vai chegando Mais outra fila se formando Como é grande esse sofrer A passos lentos A vacina vai chegando Mais outra fila se formando como é grande esse sofrer Se não bastasse para aumentar esse lamento Como é grande o sofrimento Tanta água em nosso mundo Mas não chega em nosso lar Quantas barragens e os modificando tudo vão privatizando Se quiser tem que pagar Tenho a esperança Transformando esse lamento No mais bonito cantar E ver os credos Todas as cores e os amores Ainda que em meio às dores, no mais lindo esperança. E ver os credos, todas as cores e os amores. Ainda que em meio às dores, no mais lindo esperança. Ah, 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 ah. Muito obrigada, Ed, por essa. Thank you so much, Ed, for this very inspiring rendition and for your creativity and your talent. I'm the one who thanks all of you. Oh, we are off to a good start with this voice from the Amazon, and we send big hugs to everyone there. And now we will move on to our next session that will be led by Bishop Mar Marinez Basolto. She's a bishop at the Episcopalian Church of the Amazon. And she is in Belém do Pará. So welcome, Bishop. And you have the floor. Good morning, good morning, homie. Good morning, everyone who's with us, everyone who is with us in the social networks. It's very good to be here for this discussion and also to pray for the situation that we're living in Brazil, this humanitarian tragedy that is not caused just by COVID, but by the irresponsibility of this negationist government that we have in our country and the motivation of our seminar, the Brazilian tragedy, a risk to the common home, which brings this process that we're living through, which is the deconstruction of democracy in Brazil, the overthrowing of democracy in Brazil. And it has led our country to several emergencies in all fields, in the religious field, the economic field, human rights, biodiversity, environmental justice, in the health field, and we're living through very hard times where we're losing rights. And it began with the coup that was, that overthrew President Dilma and continues with our current government. And we want to reflect on all of this. And if the Brazilian tragedy, also considering COVID that worsened all of this situation, it, it is a risk to our common home. We know that the lack of empathy shown by this government has made 
COVID-19, a humanitarian tragedy and caused the death of over 400,000 people, also bringing back hunger and, and broadening the gap of inequality. So we have been going through very hard times. The current scenario is a necropolitic scenario. It is a politics of death. And the, our second session has as a theme, temple and democracy, the risks to the common home. And we'll count with our writer, Rosani Borges. She will be with us in a few minutes. And we will also have our very special guests, Dr. Olav Feise Tveit. He's the representative of the Episcopalian Conference of the Church of Norway. And he was the counselor of the World Council of Churches. And he renounced that office in 2020 to occupy the current office he occupies now. Rosani Borges is a journalist, a researcher, a collaborator of the Multidisciplinary Center of Research in Collaborative Research and Digital Languages in USP. And she has a PhD in Communication Sciences, and she has a few books published. Media and Racism, Journal, and Radio, The Art of Talking and Hearing, and Unfaithful Mirror, the Black People in Journalism. So I didn't introduce myself, homie said a few words about me, but I will introduce myself. And since Rosani is not with us, I will give the floor to Dr. Olaf. But my name is Marines Vassopo. I am a bishop at the Episcopalian Church of Brazil and at the Amazonian Diocese, which is made up of five states in the Brazilian Amazon region. I live in the city of Belém, but our region of the diocese is composed by the states of Pará, Amazonas, Acre, Amapá, and Roraima. It's a very large geographical area and that has a lot of inequality. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Olaf, who's joining us. Welcome him and say that we really want to hear what he has to say, and then we will have Roseanne with us to hear as well. Welcome, Dr. Olaf. Please, we want to hear everything you have to tell us. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, invitation to participate in this seminar. Um, actually, I uh, was told, and I hope that you still stick to that, that I hear Roseanne first, um, because I want to, to hear um, that message and also add my comments to it uh, in addition to my, my own reflections. So um, if you allow us, I, I would prefer that. Of course, so we will wait for Roseanne and then I will ask perhaps Homi or Luz Manina maybe to make a few comments. I don't know if Ed it with, is with us or wants to sing a song. And we could also bring forth the questions that were written down in the chat box and maybe answer a few questions that were asked. Ed, are you with us? If you're with us and you can bring, uh, you can sing a song or perhaps repeat the song you have already sung.
Bem, quem sabe é... eu posso Perhaps dizer... Perhaps I could say a few words. Can I say a few words, Bishop? Please, Luz Marina, I would be happy to hear what you have to say. Well, we are currently waiting our next panelist. She had some problems and she's a little bit late, so we will wait for her so that Dr. Olaf can make comments about her intervention. But as organizers of the seminar, we had a very short time to organize because we are currently going through an emergency and Brazil is going through several emergencies actually. And these emergencies accumulate right now because of the pandemic, but we know we have gone through a process of undermining democracy in Brazil, which is the theme of our current section Passion, and how has democracy been undermined throughout these years? And in my studies that I have carried out about the impeachment of President Juma, I identified this process as beginning in 2013. And how is it that throughout all of these years, uh, ever since 2013, the rejection of the results of the 2014 election and then the impeachment of President Duma, followed by all of this lawfare process against President Lula. I see those as steps. And also, as Olivia has mentioned, the expensive ceiling, how all of these things lead us to the situation of total emergency in Brazil. So I think we are in this international scenario. We are listening not only to our own voices and the voices of the experts that are dealing with the themes that we have identified as priority themes, but also listening to the reactions of our international guests because these comments also present pathways to international ways we can deal with the situation. So that's why I think our, I think our professor is with us. So we thank her for her presence and we want to hear from you and your very important remarks for Brazil and for the world because this has a lot of international impact. So thank you, everyone. I'll introduce you again. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Rosani, she's a journalist, researcher, collaborator of the Interdisciplinary Center of Research in Collaboratory in Digital Languages of the USP, University of Sao Paulo School uh, of Communication. Uh, college and she has a series of books published you have the floor now well thank you bishop marinez and all of you for your invitation uh, uh, i give you my best my greetings i, I apologize uh, i was teaching a class i was teaching a lesson before this So this theme is urgent. It is something that is in the agenda. That is, it is in our daily agenda. It is a theme that we have different perspectives, different prisma to look in, uh, through. And, uh, and now we're talking about democracy and this temple of democracy. It is something that perhaps it feels negative, but it signals a belief, the belief in transformation in the radical change. Under this point of view, I have the five steps of Antonio Grandes, uh, but we must be pessimistic in analysis and optimist, optimistic in the inactions. And there is no way out of that. The scenario that has been drawn upon us is a scenario that is not so auspicious, 
but it is a scenario that we can create possibilities of this transformation and in building by, by civilization, new civilization parameters that I am certain that a whole discussion that back in the 90s, the Brazilian elite, the Brazilian uh, bourgeois uh, gave up uh, to think, gave up thinking about development, this development uh, idea, well, they went towards the neoliberal politics or policies. And we see that in 2018, things went a bit deeper. The bourgeois, the Brazilian elite, and part of the Brazilian society uh, decided not to move forward in the civilization process. And this is quite severe. It, it, think democracy, thinking democracy without showing that the civilization rules are at stake, while well, it requires us to uh, go back a few steps in the analysis, COVID has been showing in the anti-politics with regards uh, of COVID that the world it has fallen apart and everything is broken. But for us to survive, we pretend that certain things still exist. I believe this is still healthy. This is what makes us remain alive, but we must recognize that this is only a game. The world has fallen apart. Things are crumbling. And from this moment of ruin, of destruction, we must, from that, we must think about possibilities of, of transformation actions and changes, in radical changes, rather. I will read, I believe uh, a reverend has heard uh, me reading that there are some new elements, but this is a text that says a lot about all the debate that we are establishing here. My dear friend, Scaldesi Nascimento has heard me reading that, and I apologize for the ones who have heard part of this understanding, but once again, I believe they are necessary. Civil war against the forms of existence. Well, we may say that the diagnosis that Carmela, that is great to hear you, Carmela, she has uh, her qualified hearing. And we may say that the daily diagnosis converge to highlight elements on the social dynamics and the so in contemporary politics. The consolidation of a civil war, that's what I'm sustaining. We are facing a civil war where the fascism, the ascending fascism intends to suppress the forms of life that do not obey the male, the white male conservative Christian standard is preferably evangelical, but it's not generalizing, but within a, a lineage, if I may, evangelical, well, heteronormative and neoliberal, the minority will have to bend the knee to the majority, just like well, the Bolsonaro family has said Bolsonaro and his family in their victory speech back in 2018, the, mili the declared militarization and the political facing, the unlimited use of institutional uh, juridical violence under the laughable veal of democracy in the practice. And that's why I say it's laughable because we are not in a democracy anymore. The practice of self-truth in direct confrontation against scientific data of experience of collective uh, intellectuality, the new extractivism that creates the natural reserves, a source of uh, gathering of an unstoppable capitalism, bringing problems of the maroon populations with the growth of sexism and pa the patriarchy. We have an extreme show that is with Minister Salis, uh, the environment minister, in this exploration, uh, the the decrease or diminishing of the indigenous practices. And now we have a federal police uh, police deputy that uh, that was acting in the limit of reasonability. And now he's uh, denouncing all the practices of government 
not only in non-respecting the legislation, but advancing violently over territories in, in a cruel manner. It is scary what we face in this moment, this combination of the economic liberalism with the reactionary conservationism, uh, married by interest, marriage by interest, if I may. And so in uh, the increase of this picture of horror, the president of Brazil, Jair Messias Bolsonaro, is a legitimate son of that. His appeal to the, to the barbarianism. And COVID shows that a aesthetical decadence that are more and more grotesque, the disdain for education and culture, all of that that has to do with civilization and mankind, this government is against. This abhorrent phase, especially in the Brazilian scenario, because well, this combination that sustains it in the illiberal liberalism, if I may, and I, I, I say that because many authors say that liberalism, it count well with practices, individualistic practice, and and, the, and not even the the freedoms that this liberalism should bring. It does, and you must remember that it comes with the slave owners to be liberal and be slaverist is not even a scandal well it could be in other places in the world so we must think which liberalism is that this is something that has lived together with slavery and um, legitimated it which in principle would be a a, a contrast sense if i may this makes a connection with uh, archaic imaginary that brings roots in slavery and uh, patriarchy. And besides the recent, well, recently the President Bolsonaro has mentioned that he was not going to punish the large holdings that practice slave uh, trade. Uh, very opposite, he said that what you had in the field, it was a, a type of a terrorism of the small producers of the landless workers movement and for the owners of the agribusiness not to be concerned because he would not punish them. This was just now, quite recently, so just last week. Besides the concerns with the loss, the loss in the democracy that uh, is troubling all of us, it's amazing the, the, the decadence of this liberalism that, that is only economic right now, responsible for bearing the ideas of political liberalism, the individual autonomy, tolerance, diversity, and plurality. So in Brazil, the liberal had never have never been liberal. And this format, the adoption of this economic liberalism alone has in one of this uh, cornerstone, the Pinochet administration and the issues that have brought by the Chicago boys. They are the Chicago old just like uh, Paulo Guedes. Not even Margaret Thatcher's administration went so far to try and dilapidate the liberal movement. I'll, I will move forward in due to well, time. So I, I'd like to, to hear how long do I still have after this scenario to talk a bit. You have 15 minutes now. From now. Okay. So from this scenario on, a, an abbreviated scenario, well, um, of an anti-humane government, anti-civilization government, and a democracy that was uh, already sick, now it is buried. Well, it's not enough to say the institutions are working to say that there's still democracy, no. Uh, or to say that we have a free, you still have a free press. Well, this is, those episodes, those characteristics, they do not guarantee that in well our democracy exists in fact and considering that um what we have is a destruction well we all were could uh, because it was is a, a coup after another and how can we think the other impact the civilization impact and the other political grammar if i may and now i'll bring the discussion uh, and the 
the black feminism and all the discussions that we have the intelligence and expertise we have projects to be protagonists together with other historically discriminated groups first to offer another project of country a new civilization pact because if it is the truth that what we have today is the continuation of of a past that is never left in the past. And uh, every time I hear Paulo Guedes, well, it feels like I, uh, we're hearing a slave uh, lord. And Paulo Guedes, he just said recently that the people want to live 100 to 120 years. And for that, the guilt, the blame for the collapse of the health system was not COVID, but the fact that health improved, medicine improved and advanced. This very Paulo Guedes says, said that you know it, it was terrible that even maids wanted to go to disney world i don't know if you remember that so he says it, you know it was a, a party uh the the maids were going and he just said the 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 son of the doorman that got a zero in an sat uh was able to go due to the student loans was able to go uh, to college so this is something archaic that who wanted slavery to remain. Uh, so you will only ask this question if you go from the principle that some people are not, human, are not humans in the matrix of the colony and slavery. That's what made us as a people uh, and shows that, that showing that people, there are people that the rights are, they're not entitled to rights. And when we talk about the protagonism of the non-white people or the people of color in general, and everyone uh, destitute of land. Well, we're talking about not only an experience, but a view of the world of the ones who are in the fringe, because they are able to see things crumbling apart. So the idea of the provoking you is how can we make these people new uh, players in the political dynamics. Subjects that were not thought as such. In, we thought about the, the game and this, in the people, uh, we haven't th seen these people uh, as subject to, to human rights. Well, but we need to go back and think about the value of humans that we in the progressist field in the left wing we still operate so it is impo is important to for us to rethink the category of humanity humans and human oh so this is a new form of politics and well we lost brazil has lost for brazil in this task of training our imagination this shows a poly a political urgency for us to institute new forms of action and reflection to give word to the vulnerable and how can we uh, create this insurrection and propose, propose a design of new openings of new routes well the opening of new routes well for the, the most the excluded well we hear voice that have a universal reach to this task and i'd like to say that it's not only rhetorical although the french revolution has collaborated with the universalizing and emancipatory ideals and equalitarian ones into which we have designed as a human man was not the white man that made this uh universal is it is it still working You may continue, please. Yes, it's working fine. Uh, the French Revolution, it, it only transformed a fact of world history when it was appropriated by the, the slave, the enslaved or the slave lords as it has happened in the Haitian uh, Revolution. I believe the Haitian Revolution is an example to us all because that's what happened. So the idea of the... the the ideals of the French Revolution only become universalized when they are 
brought on by the slave, the enslaved, or the Haitian Revolution says, because that's when it's for all. That's when you can cover and you can have this universalizing um, core. So to think agrarian reform and think black people and origin, uh, Aboriginal people is to understand that, well, the, the agrarian reform still needs to be thought uh, well, but if we can't reach those two, we're not thinking agrarian reform. I, I hope I have emphasized enough to say that it is not possible to build a country without these voices to participate in the decision-making platforms towards a deep transformation. They are the ones, women, indigenous, Aboriginal women, black people who are brought into new lexicon and new paradigms in the new ethos. So in a radical way, they point us that what is necessary for the austerity plan of a, a Paulo Guedes of sort is a, just a different way of life. So it's not only, we don't need to say Paulo Guedes, what you say is this dehumanizing because his conception of life is in the fight against another type of life. So we, we need to bring in the, under this debate, well, when when we are amazed by the the crazy things that Paul Gad say, what idea of life, what the ideal or the concept of life this government, this administration has? So we need to oppose this plans of to oppose to Paul Gadges and to bring a new idea of life that has in, in its core of sharing instead of saving for the the state to have austerity. So. In talking and dialoguing, instead of talking in fight against suffering with what they speak and what they say, and to celebrate victories that so far that we have reached, instead of uh, in, make them in, invalidated. So that's why I mean, uh, uh, that's what I mean by being optimistic in actions. So it is not possible to measure the size of the strength, the indigenous movements and black movements in the. Uh, so American um, continent has upon having the this quality of life. And, and we must understand what and against what we are fighting and open doors for the saving discovery of the new, uh, the thousands of understanding of the good living forms that uh, in spite of being different, they are not an enemy to one another. And just like the indigenous populations, we, black women, we present another concept of life and another concept of development that went against neoliberalism, going against any armor that comes from it. So, so it's not only to fight for recognition, we need to question the norms that probably establish the, a different recognition. This is from Judith Butler. I like it because when we think we're thinking democracy and politics, we're thinking the sharing of the common. And more often than not, we question how the sharing is done in terms of political representativity, in terms of uh, who has the public space and who thinks the common. Historically, is the black women and in Aboriginal and uh, indigenous populations that brings up these norms, emphasizing the needs of new arrangement exhorting the Brazilian society to the game. So we need to win the game. We need to uh, create politics with a capital P. So, and I evoke Shingu Shab on that. Well, and we must resume and create new uh, labor forms. Well, it may be a loss in the compass for many of us. And we who are in the progressive field and we look back and say, well, we've done a lot of things. How can we start from scratch? And I tell you, it's, it is not, it, it doesn't mean to flirt with tabula rasa. No, it is to, first and foremost, we need to have an inventory of reflections and practices that, that are being uh, worked out in other parts of the world. It's just not in the common. So in each time, black women and all uh, members in the fringe of the system, they are proposing new reconfiguration of politics. Uh, foreseeing the, the 
all the issues that uh, have existed well in the point of view have the black feminism the indigenous women the movement of indigenous women became phenomenon uh, in evidence part of the society saw what they have as intolerable and saw the possibility of seeing something different um, with Paulo Gadges, uh, we must, against Paulo Gadges, we need to defend life against the issues of democracy and, uh, and the unpresent of the Republic. We must restate them fully against the, act, the attacks against the multiple existences of women, gays, uh, men and women or lesbians. So we must ensure the rights of different forms of being in the world. In our periods of in our history, the black women and the others uh, that uh, denounce the democratic deficit. So when we hear, well, it's legitimate uh, for these people to speak that our democracy is in peril and uh, and allied and the white people, uh, urban people, progressists, they say today that we live with a democratic de deficit and the black population says that since the 19th century and it says more there was no republic that's what he said we were remo removed from the public uh, affairs and that's they are the ones who did the, the if you follow the history of brazil before Manuel castro's uh, works became a uh, reference Branco, ocidental, né? Cristão. I also don't know Christian to straight and even calling the attention to white feminism who used to drink from this fountain, not to not pluralize the vision of woman. So this is not an identitarian fight. And here I talk about elections, but I will skip this part because we're short on time. And then I think we can we can talk about this new beginning in situations of crisis by reflecting about this, by considering the role of the people who are at the margins, who are always prevented from talking and from using the the common the common place and in the words of spivak can the subaltern speak and when the ability to listen is conceived this people at the margins really bring forth their voices and in Lula's government we had this social change and we had an effective transformation considering black people but we were not really part of the design of the public policies even in this government that promoted such great changes and inclusion of as we said in college the flasks and pills and we are never seen as the person who the, the person who define the path of the new collective ground and the expansion of rights of the black and indigenous and lgbt population but they remained as beneficiaries of public policies which left gaps gaps for this unfinished democracy to be questioned and it is fundamental for any proposal of transformation and consolidation of democracy which is now overthrown the reconfiguration of the common ground understanding this common ground as a space divided by different spaces times and forms of activity that are carried out by subjects who have the ability to define themselves how they are part of the processes and reorganizing this political system in brazil reorganizing the political system in brazil 
from outside of the institutions, since we are outside of the institutions, implies disturbing the basis of these institutions and this common ground so that our ideas of change do not perpetuate the historical inequalities that prevented the subjectivities that all from defining their own destinies. And Lela Gonzalez, when she initiated a speech in Pulki Hill, I'm already, com I'm already concluding. I'm coming to an end, Bishop. Uh, so talking about the democratic formation in Brazil, taking into account what we are being taught about the present, we need to turn the game and be able to envision a world where, where each person's and everyone's life matters. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Perfectly, uh, very well put. It was wonderful to hear from you and to hear your perspective. It's very challenging for us to think about this reconstru reconstruction of civilizatory parameters, a new social pact, a new idea of life that says a lot about sharing and fighting and rapprochement, justice, and really the well-being of all persons. And now we will give the floor to Dr. Olav. We have introduced him already, and we would like to hear from him. Thank you so much. And thank you for again for this invitation to participate in, in, in your seminar. Uh, I feel very honored to be included in this uh, very sincere, but also I would say very dramatic uh, session of reflecting on uh, on your situation uh, in Brazil and what's what's happening to your, your people and your beautiful nation in this time. Uh, and let me also from the beginning uh, express my, my sympathy, but also my condolences with you for all the losses of people but also of, of, of health. Even those who, who survive often get severe health problems uh, as a, a long-standing effect of this uh, terrible uh, pandemic uh, virus. Um, I also want to greet my, my friends from the ecumenical family whom, with whom we have been working uh, in many ways and in many times before. And, some of you I, I see here and some of you might be also attending. Uh, it's an honor for me to be back uh, connecting to you and also recalling strong and important memories from our work, but also from my visit to Brazil in different capacities, also before my, my time as General Secretary for the World Council of Churches. One of my tasks in the first years as, as a General Secretary of the World Council was to bring back to Sao Paulo to um, the attorney, chief attorney of Sao Paulo, all a copy of all the documentation we had in the archives in the World Council of Churches from the human rights defenders of Brazil and what had been told their lawyers that kept secret uh, about what had happened. And it was by a combination of different actors and one of them was also a WCC staff brought out of Brazil and to, to our archives in, 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 in Geneva as a documentation of what happened. And my, my task was to bring it back so that the story could be told for anybody what did happen at that time. And the name of the project was Brazil Nunca Mais, Brazil Never Again. Uh, it was really a project of, uh, I would say, a combination of human rights experts. I mean, people who really knew what global and universal human rights means and what they should mean in practice, but also practitioners. I mean, people who really was willing to sacrifice their own security to, to, to defend others, but also in a combination with um, church leaders, actually, the, the Archbishop of Sao Paulo, but also church people, activists and others. Uh, 
and the ecumenical family and the ecumenical family's institutions. Uh, that could bring a difference into the situation. Uh, and I think that is uh, my, my starting point and my reflection is that uh, even if it was again, it came again, this type of suppression, this type of abuse of power, this uh, crisis for the marginalized people, uh, as you have described it so well in your uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Rosan, uh, it is also possible to do it again, <laughs> to change this development again. And I think that is, uh, that is the hope we have to share and the, the hope that has to be qualified in, in reflections like this, what, what can we do and what, what is possible to do? Uh, what can we learn from the past in that sense, but also what is, what is the task of our time? What is, what is God calling us to do, to put it in our, in our Christian language? And then uh, I, have to be say, I have to say that I'm, um, I'm, I'm very sad and even depressed by hearing your stories. And I read them in our newspapers, some of them, and we get different sources of information that this kind of political suppression an anti-democratic power is done explicitly in the name of what is claimed to be Christian values. What, what makes it in a way even worse for us as churches. Uh, and therefore I also want to, to honor the, the, the National Council of Churches in Brazil for, for taking this initiative because it, it is really a matter of <laughs> fighting for the real Christian values. Those values who can carry people through a crisis like this, and therefore also uh, values that, that ha they have to be <laughs> reintroduced and reclaimed again and again. Uh, this uh, situation of the pandemic has shown, I think, some of the some of the very significant dimensions of the, the, the ministry of the church, the diaconia of, of the church and the churches together in times like this. And let me just point to a few um, uh, elements of what, what it means and which also was part of my last, uh, last task as the secretary of the WCC when, when the, the pandemic was <laughs> rolling over the world, uh, uh, what we in, in our discussion, for example, with the World Health Organization discussed what must be the role of the church in, in a crisis like this. And I remember very well that uh, they, they emphasized again and again that the church must be the voice of the truth. Uh, the church must tell the truth, uh, both the scientific truth about what, what is really at stake and what, what are we dealing with, but also what, what has to be done. And to avoid that religion is used for conspirations, for, for manipulation, but also for um, uh, what you now see, unfortunately, uh, very, uh, I would say, dangerous way of dealing <laughs> with people's lives. Uh, I think this, this matter of truth uh, is really a matter of, of our Christian faith. And, and, and we should again and again as churches be, be asking ourselves, are we really sharing the truth? Um, and of course, it is a, not only a scientific issue. It is also a matter of, of, of reporting and, and analyzing what's going on. What are the forces, um, not only the virus, but also as you describe it, the political forces that also take advantage of crises like this to some extent to increase power, but also to increase dominance and increase divisions and marginalization and exclusion of certain parts of society. And this, uh, I mean, it's extremely human, but it is one of the human <laughs> deeply 
uh, I would say one of the proofs of, of the, the Christian doctrine of original sin comes again forward again that we always are making the others, some others guilty, some others have to be the scapegoats to be stigmatized and so forth. And then the other dimension of, uh, of the church ministry actually was very interesting that the WHO also reminded us that now you have to, you have to really be churches. Uh, you, have to, you have to do what you are able to do. You should not step back and say, uh, we can't do anything. You should actually do what you can do. So it was a very strong voice of empowerment saying, now we need you because, I mean, we, we as WHO, we are not reaching the people you are reaching. Uh, we are not able to serve them in the local communities like you can. You, we are not able to, to overcome in some ways uh, the loneliness, the, the isolation, you are the people to do it. You are those who can also be the leaders for many. And in many countries, as we truly see, people should listen more to you as religious leaders than they should to the political leaders. And then again, they reminded us that uh, to, to act in a, in a situation of crisis as a church in the name of the love of God, is both to do something, but it also definitely to define what you don't do. And in this very special case, it, <laughs> you have to show our love, our, our love by some distancing. But in that way of really making our daily decisions about why do we care for the other and how do we do it by very practical measures of what we are not doing. But we can also transfer this to, to, the, to the structural level and to the political level. Uh, what are we not accepting? What are we not doing? Is also very important uh, in a situation like this. It is not only about <laughs> what we can do, but also what we should and cannot and, and, and do, do not in a situation like this. And finally, uh, let me also uh, then lead this into, into what I think we have seen as one of the, also the great, I would say the, the great legacies uh, but also the, the assets of the ecumenical movement that also come from particularly your continent, uh, namely the understanding of, of justice and justice as part of the Christian message, but also the, the Christian call. Um, and therefore this uh, statement of, of the, the call to see, to, to make a preferential uh, uh, I would say perspective and also uh, choice for, for the poor to, to look at the world from the oppressed perspective as God's perspective not only as, as another interesting view but it is, it is this is God's perspective to the world and therefore um, I'm encouraged to, to listen to what I hear today uh, both from from uh, from uh, from the professor, but also from the the UN special rapporteur, that that the church has great allies, but also I would say people who can challenge the church in a proper way about what our task is, both from the perspective of the marginalized, but also from the perspective of the universal uh, uh, system of, of of human rights, and then. Um, I could like to, to share a few few reflections about <laughs> what what I hear and also what what we uh, see in in your case, but also in, in many other cases at this time uh, related to democracy. Um, it is it is really a time of uh, challenge and I would say crisis for for the the. The democracies in the world and, and, the, and the democracy as a way to bring justice to, to all in a nation but also in a global perspective. Uh, in a time when we need those values more than I would say almost ever before, they are under such threat and also under such um, deconstruction as, as you describe them. So even in the name of democracy in the sense of being elected, 
democracy is deconstructed. And that reminds us that democracy is much more than, than processes of having elections. Uh, it is really also to build a culture of democracy built on moral values, but also on, on real legal systems that are uh, working, but also kept in, 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 in order for, for, for protecting those who need the legal systems to protect their lives. The legal system is not there to protect the privileged, it's to protect everybody, and particularly those who are more vulnerable than others. And therefore, it's also, it's very worrying to hear that uh, the constitution is amended to, to do the opposite. I mean, it's, it's really against uh, the whole idea of democracy and also the, the effect of it is to de uh, the destabilization of the whole country. And I think actually what we heard and also what I've learned from other from other who analyzes uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon of, of inequality is that it might, might look like that some are privileged and of course they are in, in a system of inequality, but in the long run, it creates an instability that hurts the whole society, everybody. It doesn't bring happiness to some in the long run. It really uh, destroys the stability and security of all. But what is most important is that it is, it is not bringing what can actually bring a nation forward, uh, a nation forward as a strong, healthy, but also as a strong uh, contribution to, to uh, the people, but also to the world outside. And that is why I think my, my last perspective uh, I will bring here. I mean, I, I have the privilege to, to be invited to your Brazilian reflection. I'm an outsider, I'm a white man. I, I, I belong to the privileged in the world uh, in that sense, but also that you bring me into your reflection gives me uh, an opportunity to both to say that uh, Brazil has always impressed me in many ways. I mean, uh, I think I remember that my conclusion after my first visit uh, 20, 25 years ago was that actually Brazil has everything. Uh, I mean, you have all the natural resources, you have all the beautiful people, you have uh, all kinds of people gathered there, but you also have all the challenges <laughs> and all, the, um, in a way, all the problems. But I would say you have also shown that you have all the potential to, to make a change. My first visit was long before uh, President Lula's uh, time as a president. And I've also then been able to see, for example, through our uh, assembly in 2006 uh, and other visits to the Brazilian country, that social reform is possible. Dramatic social reform to the better is possible. Uh, and that was uh, also an encouragement to hear um, President Lula's own word when he visited uh, me in, in Geneva last year, that his, uh, his uh, faith uh, in this, and his hope that it, it is still possible uh, to, to, to change Brazil again was really uh, in his mind and in his heart and in his uh, uh, commitment. I also had this pri privilege to meet with uh, President Dilma we also had the same message uh, when, when we met that even uh, all these injustices happen, uh, still change and social reform, and political reform is possible. But I also realized that Brazil is so big <laughs> that whatever happened in Brazil has an enormous effect on your whole continent, on, 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 on the region, but also in the world. Uh, so even if you cannot uh, say immediately uh, that <laughs> what, what is the effect on this and that, but the total effect is that um, when democracy is failing in Brazil, uh, democracy in the world really also gets another problem. <laughs> uh, the world needs strong uh, 
democracies like Brazil, who can handle, uh, at least do a lot to handle, nobody can be perfect and no nation is perfect, to handle uh, diversity, to handle uh, uh, also the enormous stewardship of natural resources of uh, what you have as part of the, of the world's uh, survival, uh, also in terms of environmental challenges. So uh, let me end by, by saying that um, the church, I would say that the soul of the church is at stake here. Uh, the church is in trouble when our Christian values, uh, our Christian message is used for this kind of division, for oppression, for injustice. The church also must raise its voice, but also it's its head and its, uh, its unity, the real unity of the church is built on what God has given us as love, as justice, but also as hope. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Dr. Olav. Thank you so much, Dr. Olav, for your contribution, for your vision and your that has really shed light on our discussion and really aligned with Professor Rosan's position. And now we will open for questions very briefly. I have two questions that are selected here, but if anybody else wants to ask a question, you can do so in the chat box and we will select a few questions. It will not be possible to answer all questions, but I will open the questions mentioning two questions and also tell Professor Rosani that people are requesting your text of the presentation you just gave. So if you could share that with us. And Dr. Olaf brings us this very important reflection about the fact that the anti-democratic powers have used Christian values. And as a church, we have a, an important role in Brazil in securing the right to freedom of religion and truth and our coherent positioning and also point to everything that needs to be uh, addressed in our society. So we have two questions here. And if Dr. Olaf would like to answer, they're also important. One of which is about the lack of employment the unemployment issue that we have and food insecurity and unemployment in Brazil. And the question is, the unemployment problem and the, and the lack of the financial aid to all vulnerable populations leads pop, uh, populations to the streets trying to make a living. And we have thousands of people that are connected with opportunities. But do you see this serious problem we have in Brazil faced with this government as inhumane? And the second question, most of the left-wing parties and groups do not know the Haitian revolution and still follow the Eurocentric logic of the French Revolution. We are still adopting an Eurocentric view that it's positivist, rationalism, rationalizing, and encyclopedic. Wouldn't it be important for religious institutions to stop depending on the North? I can try to comment on these two questions. Um, I think, uh, as as it is said, but also as 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 uh, we can see and as we 
I partly know, you know better than me, how, how the pandemic uh, is not only about um, virus, it's, it's, it's really about economics, it's about uh, unemployment, and uh, that this is extremely serious, particularly for economies where people are very dependent on, on the, even their daily income. But particularly um, insecurity related to jobs uh, take away the basis for, for um, not only for a decent life, but for, for, uh, for a, a stabilized and also a serious uh, perspective on, on being able to solve other challenges of life. So, yes, uh, I mean, any politics and particularly what I think what you have in Brazil, I have to say, forcing this, these changes um, towards real inhuman uh, results. The, the government itself also appears to be inhuman. I mean, I have to say, it's incredible uh, what, what, we, what we learned about the Brazilian government. Uh, I, I still have difficult to believe it, what you tell. Uh, and therefore also totally unchristian. I mean, it's absolutely against what, what we are called to do as Christian citizens, believing in Christian values. I mean, even if you have a, a, a I think uh, there are many reasons to have a separation of church and state, that the church is not ruling the, the nation, but those who claim to rule a nation based on Christian values cannot claim these kind of values uh, to be Christians. Uh, the other very significant uh, point you are making uh, mm -hmm. in that question is about that human rights in, in, a, in, a, in a Eurocentric perspective as, as the, the citizens' rights in a, in a what you say, in, a, in that sense um, of principles more than the people's movement it will not work. But the other, on the other hand, I think it's also very important that, that we claim that human rights are universal. Uh, I mean, it, it's not only a, an abstract principle. It, it, is, it, is a, it is a principle that has to be materialized in people's life, but also in people's actions. And therefore, yeah, I believe you're right. Um, there, there is a great need for other types of revolutions than, than the French Revolution. Uh, uh, and um, I think also actually uh, the, the revolution that takes away the religious dimension of, of, of life is not helping the marginalized people either, uh, rather to the contrary. But it must be a use of, uh, not a misuse of religion. Uh, working for change. Thank you. Eu meu microfone está aberto. Eu acho posso me responder, well, pastora. I believe um Yeah. Yes, you may answer and then there's a question specifically to you. Well, someone asked if the hunger and uh, the starvation and is a demonstration of a lack of humanity. Well, it is a consequence of a government that is not committed to the very country it's ruling. So the logics, this logics of this market logics, because in which market is this? That it, this is the desert of rights, is the non-commitment with the development, the individual development in the development of the country and the dilapidation and the, and the shun against the most vulnerable. So, and every day the Minister of Economy says the state is broke. And he says that to say that you won't have it anymore. It's done, it's over. And it is a principle, let's say, anti-humanistic and cruel and it's undeniable. Well, we have 118 uh, million people without food security. And I believe half of them is uh, facing starvation. So many people uh, having bad lunch 
uh, having a bad lunch and others having no lunch at all. So how can we face the situation? I believe there was uh, a matter of observation and, and to abandon the, what is ours. Oh, I was looking recently the, at the cases, the episodes, um, in recent ones, episodes in Mozambique and how the Brazilian press uh, did, doesn't say anything. So we are a country there is very Africanized, not only because the, most of our population is, uh, is black, we're the largest black population outside of Africa, but it's not only a matter of numbers, it's a civilization issue. That, well, we're civilized by Africa. We speak as we do because uh, we're Ubuntu. And uh, so all of our forms have existed. It was a, a fundamental matrix, but curiously, we became an anti-African country. We did not, we're not aware of the continent. And uh, I believe it's time for us to build other links because there are even the links of our very formation an African-based formation. And we must think what our neighbors, because we deal badly because Brazil is huge in South America and apparently Brazil doesn't want to be South American, doesn't want to integrate politically the Latin America. So how we dialogue, how are our discussions within our neighboring countries? And there, I see this is a fundamental purpose seeking an autonomous path and our path without being dependent on anyone because the dependency is not only economic in terms of what we consume. Brazil is a huge exporter of uh, raw materials and commodities, but we depend on, we rely on other people's technologies to, to make the products to, to go around, but it's, we depend also intellectually in but this is a self-awareness process. And the social movements have had this great role of creating other references and bringing other names in, people who were important for the fights, the very landless workers movement was a, a fundamental organization to build other uh, uh, references that we saw in the indigenous and black movement. And I believe that's the way to go. That's the path. Thank you, Rosani. We're not going to be able to answer the other questions. And I'll, I'll leave it echoing. This is uh, sent to Rosani, but given the, to do so we're being short on time, but I'll leave this question echoing. The question was asked to Rosani, but all of us can reflect upon it. What do you see as the path towards the reconstruction of democracy in Brazil? What humans will come from the emergencies of the present time? And so I'll leave this question echoing around us. And I'd like to thank uh, the speakers and uh, all the, in the comments. Now we have uh, have Bishop Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, my dear Marines, in the construction of this first round table, I'd like once again to welcome all of you who are following us uh, this morning, this beginning of a seminar, when we gather to have this discussion, this dialogue between churches, faith-based organizations and in the defense of human rights when we dream, because we have had very little time to host uh, the, the seminar, we were thinking how to compose the seminar and who we would invite. And we started very well. So I'd like to welcome the people who are in our webinar that accepted our invitation, the people who are in our social networks uh, following us. We have had great uh, lectures and uh, 
things that would allow us to reflect upon what we are living and how we will face in this process of deconstruction of democracy, current democracy in Brazil. And, and before I welcome our next guests that will certainly bring up even more voices and reflections uh, after I was provoked by Dr. Rosani Borges and, and uh, about what her, what about her very instigating uh, lecture. And I'll start with a poem, a poem of Conceição Evaristo, Women Voices. And she says, the voice of my great grandmother echoed as a child in the uh, basements of the ships. The voice of my grandmother echoed with obedience to the white slave masters. The voice of my mother echoed with a uh, well revolted in the kitchens of other people's kitchens, doing the laundry in the dusty roads. My voice is still echoes perplexed verses with rhymes of blood and starvation. The voice of my daughter gathers all of our voices, gathers the mute, muted quiet voices in the throats. And the voice of my daughter gathers the words and the acts of yesterday, of today, and of now under the voice of my daughter will be heard with the echo of life and the freedom. I was provoked, Dr. Rosani, by uh, what you have said when you mentioned that we need to listen to the voices that were always in the fringe of our society, but need but they, they are people who not only to ref, to receive the benefits, but they are subjects of history for us to start our history from scratch and have the revolution this country deserves and needs. Well, now in this second panel, uh, we have our theme table, temple, market, the threat of the fundamentalisms, the confluent fundamentalisms, and, and to bring your reflection and to help us in this seminar, we want to want to receive Professor Cunha, Professor Fabio P, and we have the international guest Edgar Arthur Santos Mendonça. He's in Germany, and he will bring a reflection on our way. So first and foremost, I'd like to greet Professor Cunha. She's quite well known because she has contributed a lot with her reflections in our field. She's a doctor in communication sciences, master in social memory, and is an undergrad in social communication. She writes uh, in uh, Carta Capital, in one of her books, oh, she's the author of Gospel Explosion, a look of the sciences on the evangelical scenario, the contemporary evangelical scenario. Magali has mentioned to us that the fundamentalisms, they manifest uh, with their own view of interpretation of world and of life, and that we must be humble to, to have the fundamentalist process for us to, to know how to act with wisdom in an articulate fashion to face that. So Magali, we're here to try and understand this alliance between time and market and all of the threats these fundamentalist alliances uh, bring to us. So you have the floor now. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Thank you. Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. Dear friend, dear fellow. 
So we are honored and very happy to bring all of you the result uh, now looking at Brazil a, of a survey that had a Latin American scope, a South American scope rather, um, with the effects of the advance of the fundamentalism over democracy and human rights. This was the Ecumenical for, uh, South American Ecumenical Forum, ACTE Alliance, which is uh, an ecumenical alliance in Latin America in the South American Forum, concerned with understanding this advance of fundamentalism in our region. And this uh, survey was published, and if someone can help us and put in chat the link of the access to this uh, ebook that people may look into the research as a whole. In the next 15 minutes, let, let me put up my, my clock here, not to get too excited and go over our time. I will bring you then a look at Brazil from this survey that was carried out and brings this elements that may help us understand Brazil. And so I put up the slides now that will help me uh, remain on time because the content is quite broad and it was instigated by what I've heard the first of our colleague from the UN and uh, Rosanna and all of so there are many things here uh, rattling our intention and I will connect this element so we this is reconfiguration of the religious fundamentalism and political fundamentalism in Brazilian land since 2000, 2010 and we must think uh, or to think this term, we must understand the context in which we are inserted, especially uh, since 2010. Well, we must say that the 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 re religious conservatives, well, the part of theology, the the one that justifies and supports the maintenance of the status quo, both Catholic as well as evangelical was always present hegemonically in Brazil. It, this is not new. This is not anything new when you talk about fundamentalism. And uh, we have historically in a religious alignment to the colonialist culture. Just as Rosani has mentioned, that is of the patriarchal is racist and with a larger, uh, with large farm owners, there is isolationism in social affairs with the historical uh, the that was always perpassing the evangelical movement and there is also the political uh, situation that the groups try to exercise in the countries uh, since always and besides the catholics well we can highlight with the evangelicals to the New Pentecostal, the, ba the Baptist and New Pentecostal. Uh, so, because we want to, uh, the Pentecostal focus is quite recent and, but this influence, this search for power, even the executive power of Brazil, it is in the hands of the Presbyterians and the Baptists besides the Catholics. And we have the progressist expressions, the libertarian that always existed, but they are minorities. Although the minority, they're significant. Olaf just mentioned the, the Brazil Nunca Mais project result from progressist expressions and ecumenical ones in the Catholic churches with evangelical ones in this process. So they're quite significant. Uh, both Catholic and evangelical um, in the public space. Um, but they are always target of repression in the churches and in government as it was in the, during the military dictatorship. The report of the Truth Commission and the importance, well, we talked about the importance of truth and we had a national commission of truth that produced a report with a chapter on the persecution of churches in the military regime and we have the the progressives, the libertarian that suffered at that moment. 
that still remain internally and externally through this device. Uh, well, since the 80s, during the redemocratization period and dictatorship, it required an intense uh, participation of the conservative groups in the national policy and the elections and the public uh, positions. That's where we'll see the strong uh, entrance of the Pentecostal power that gains the power in a numeric growth, a geographic growth, uh, and also with a uh, with the estate, and we see the three main elements. We see the Evangelical Caucus in the, in the National Congress, the, Lu, the Lula government that opened the executive power with the dialogue the government Lula establishes with evangelical groups. And these groups, they take their space in the executive power and the process of occupation of a legislative space, especially when Eduardo Cunha that uh, is evangelical in the presence of the house, in the chairmanship of the house. He gave power to the evangelicals. There was a power, gave power to the committees, important committees, in fact, such as the human rights and minorities. The executive power also was occupied with ministries directed by evangelicals since uh, the Dilma administration and the judiciary power, which is the great phenomenon, the most recent phenomenon with judges, uh, with prosecutors having positions from uh, from religious uh, backgrounds. And we'll notice, we realize in this most recent context, a an aggressive tone, an aggressive discourse in practices as well in the, tackling what these groups, the Catholic, this Catholic and evangelical groups start talk, saying enemies of faith and the traditional family. And we will see the emergence of missionisms. So saviors, leaders, and you have the Lava Jato operation, the prosecutor Doutan Dallagnol and other judges that, will, that are brought as the Messiah that came to save the nation and the Bolsonaro administration crowns that with the so-called myth, as they call it, that see he has Messiah in his name as the ones that the ones that were saved of a stabbing to save the country. A religious leader called him the Messiah, the Cyrus, that Persian uh, king that saved the. Hebrew in the, from the exile. So Bolsonaro would be the Brazilian Cyrus. And this was spoken of Trump as well in the United States, but this is a whole different story. With this text, we have a resignification of what are the fundamentalists. This term is not new. It is born with Christians, Protestants in the United States in the very beginning of the 21st century that this movement arises back in the 1910s with the search uh, of the Christian faith of what they thought was the danger of a modernity of science against the Christian faith. And since the, the 1910s, well, it got a great connotation and I don't have time to, to say it all. I'm talking about a, this important record, but you have access to the book you'll see all, all of this detail, which is strengthened with the moral majority, the new right wing in the United States that will emerge uh, during the 70s. During this process in the United States, the fundamentalisms, they get new uh, currents. Well, have the reformist, God will dominate and will defeat the materialistic, the, the black movement, the gays, by a bottom-up action by the culture and through the culture and movement. Remember the gospel movement that starts uh, joining Latin America and bring the doctrine through the song. Well, this is brought by the reformism, the fundamentalist reformism of the United States and enters Latin America. And there's the reconstruction current. God will uh, dominated by the government and the, the education, the theology of dominance that is strongly present 
currently in the ones that sustain uh, the, the support Bolsonaro government. So they were exported to Latin America in Brazil and re and resignified here in the fundamentalism term. Oh. After the Islamic and Iranian revolution towards the end of the 70s, everyone who has studied history will remember and it will be intensely used by the media after 9-11 with the terrorist attacks in the US and everybody will start talking about Islamic fundamentalism and then we will begin having a negative ima imagery of the Islamic faith that is much associated with terrorists and then the, ter the term fundamentalism was resorted to to describe fanatism, the refusal to dialogue, the refusal of plurality, the reconstruction of the moral order and reinstatement of past customs. And in Brazil, in addition to the relationship with the Islamic region, religion, the Pentecostals have taken a very accusatory tone and controlling people and entering politics. And then looking at this resignification of fundamentalism, when this was resignified and looking at the history of how the fundamentalist groups and conservative groups have occupied religion ever since Brazil was colonized and until present day, we need to, to stop using fundamentalism to accuse people who think differently, people who are not progressive and who are not part of the left wing but we also need to understand this process and not only the term. And then I always mention a researcher of fundamentalism, a Chantais, that says fundamentalism is has very concrete forms, especially interpreting reality, then the view of the world and acting in the world based on this view. And the interpretation of reality is based on a relig religious matrix. And, and it goes into the political uh, field and meets the, the political strata. And this researcher attempted to define the fundamentalisms in Latin America, in Brazil, and now we need to talk about them in the plural. There are several expressions of fundamentalism it's a worldview, it's an interpretation of reality based on a religious matrix. I will always insist on this. They are religious groups, but they're not. They're using religious discourse to be inserted into the public space. This religious uh, discourse based on Bible and Christianism is combined with political strategies to weaken democratic processes. And Olive has just said that democ democracies are going through a crisis. And in this crisis, this religious their discourse, re religious political discourse is being used to weaken reproductive rights, the rights of traditional communities, the diverse social policies in this correlation between religion and politics. And the basis of fundamentalism is reaction. And so the fundamentalisms have characteristics and I will conclude with this. Sonia, I'm not paying attention to, to my time here. How long do I have to conclude? So I can assess how much I will talk now. I will tell you very soon. You still have five minutes. Okay. So we have these characteristics that I will conclude by mentioning them. First of all, these religious groups, this Pentecostal, evangelical, traditional groups, not only Pentecostal groups, but 
when we talk about Pentecostal groups, I'm talking about churches like Assembleia de Deus, all of the historic churches, Labachi, Pentecostal Brazilian churches, Brazil for Christ or God is Love, but also Neo Pentecostal churches, the Universal Church of Brazil. There are several groups, but also traditional evangelicals, Baptist, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, and a huge group. And I'm also talking about Catholics that embrace these same, the same per perspectives. These discourses really resonate with the popular, with the people when we're talking about entrepreneurship and about families, people do like this discourse and they embrace it. And it resonates with the middle class, the search for happiness that idealized past with the privileges of class that may be retaken, meritocracy, not only it's not just poor people that embrace fundamentalisms the middle class does too and everything and also what we can call the resented morality that morality that is really angry about the rights lost because women are having rights and not black people have rights these people should not have rights they should be at home in the kitchen or doing manual labor so it's a resented morality. And Professor Cristina also calls it the loss rhetoric, the loss of privileges, the, pros, the loss of sexist privileges, the privileges of businessmen, the people who call the shots, and a feeling of revenge towards the enemy. So political groups use that in certain certain arguments are used the the bible's reading some some people which some people say is literal it is not literal it is based on a pre-existent dogma it is a selective reading of the bible the bible using what they want to justify these ideas therefore the fundamentalisms are present in Catholics and evangelicals, and even people who don't have any religion because of the religious matrix in their worldview. Is Bolsonaro a Catholic? Is he an evangelical? He's not either one, but he's a fundamentalism, a fundamentalist in relation to the religious matrix that he embraces. And so are several other politicians who are in power. So fundamentalism are not only religious, they're religious, po political, and they have environmental, cultural aspects, and they work through the dissemination of fake news and talking about the destruction of family and, and the communist uh, uh, vaccine, all of the fake news, the moral panic, all of this, really captivates people emotionally. I will conclude because of my time, my time is up. I would still have a lot of important points to make, but I invite you to, to access these more detailed characteristics and also proposals to deal with this reality that are identified in the research because we also have 10 possibilities of strategies to respond to these characteristics. So I invite you to read this material and I'm sure it will be very useful and productive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magali. Thank you for this appetizer you gave us of the book. And a lot of people are asking how they can have access to the book. We will share the link where you can access this research that is already available. So I think Magali really, when she brings all of this context, she of these fundamentalist advances and also bringing other religions, classic Protestant religions and also bringing the Catholic church 
and several movements within the Catholic Church, bringing them into the fold and calling our attention to them. And also detailing these dynamics that are happening. And when she invites us to move away from this view that is this classic view and look at how this has interfered in our practical life as an interpretation of reality that is actually a project of power that is globally widespread. So thank you very much, Magali. We will return soon with your comments when you will be taking questions. But I just want to say that we also are, our seminar is being, is currently being broadcasted via several other organizations. And also we have many people with us in the room, but we also have a partnership with the channels that are broadcasting our seminar via YouTube. We have the Resistente channel, the social movement platform for the political system reform, CONI, KISESI, PAGI, all these institutions are broadcasting our seminar. So in the name of all organizations, I would like to welcome everyone who's with us. And now I also want to invite to our round of discussion, Fabio P. He is a professor of the graduate, the social poli political graduate program in the Rio de Janeiro University. He's a theologist with Fukuhio, and he has been studying the religious movements in the rise of the fundamentalism and Bolsonaro rise to power. And he's the author of the book, Cristo Fascist Pand Pandemic, that was published on 2020. And welcome. We all want to hear from you and we are sure you will make a wonderful intervention to conclude our morning. First of all, I want to thank you, Sonia, for inviting me to be here. Thank Homi, thank Magali. Magali, she's part of the table, our round of discussion, and I'm very happy to be in her presence. And also to be in this live broadcast in several platforms. And to me, and I'm very happy for a few reasons, Magali has talked about fundamentalism and the differences and how they're expressed, how they're articulated and mobilized in Brazil and Latin America. And uh, in a sense, Magali's theme is very closely related to what, uh, can you hear me? I think so, yes. And it's very closely related to what I have to say because from 1986, 1988, we have seen this articulation of these sectors of the large corporations that are connected to fundamentalism. But I wanted to bring your attention to two things that happen in Brazil that are not very much talked about. Two lines of action by two religious sectors that are very specific in our religious traditions. The first, I, I want to bring your attention to two events, basically, because to me, events are forms of, of inserting this into our daily lives. So the first event is an event that took place in June at, of 2018, when an American Association of Baptists and Presbyterians called, invited, invited President Jair Messias Bolsonaro to discuss ideas in 2018 with this, in 2018 with this association, this right-wing association, 
a North American Association. They invited Bolsonaro and they had a dialogue about what would his, the plan for his government would be. And that's when this was elaborated. And it's very interesting to note at this event because that's when the Bolsonaro project and based on the notion of the traditional Brazilian family, the Bolsonaro project is coordinated with the what Magali said, not only Pentecostals, not only, uh, on the contrary, we have a long-standing tradition in Brazil of governmental alignment that are previous to Pentecostalism and that strengthened its results. So there was, what I mean is there was a direct connection of the Brazilian Presbyterian Church with the Bolsonaro project back in June of 2018. And the other meeting I want to cite, which is very important for us, is a meeting that took place in July and it was in Eji Macedo's farm, a very prominent pastor in Brazil, and Bolsonaro met with several evangelical organizations, and this and this meeting was called the the celebration of the handshakes, and it's when Bolsonaro shakes the hands of Eji Macedo and the Universal Brazilian Church, and they shake hands. Also, Mark Felicianos, all of the Pentecostal Brazilian uh, organizations do this very Pentecostal celebration with the garment and their rituals. And the, this platform serves as a political basis for Jair Messias Bolsonaro. So the second event that happened in July of 2018 is the celebration uh, uh, called the handshake is when Jair Messias Bolsonaro shakes the hand of the Pentecostal leaders in Brazil. And when Edi Macedo will talk about, you get to know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And Edi Macedo relates that truth was never a platform before in Brazil and that Bolsonaro would represent that truth. And that's where Bolsonaro uh, started basing his political platform to organize his campaign. And there are a lot of models that were created at that time. And this meeting with the Pentecostal leaders, all representatives of Brazilian Pentecostal traditions and Jair Bolsonaro. It was a huge event with 200 attendants. The other event I mentioned didn't have that many attendants, but the, the leaders, Socrates Oliveira, Deltan, several religious leaders met with Bolsonaro to coordinate his government plan. So what happens is Jair Messias Bolsonaro, as Magali has said, he is from a fundamentalist tradition. He's from a conservative tradition and his trajectory, his campaign is based on these agreements that were celebrated and all of his speeches during the campaign was based on biblical jargons and he uses the text of Joseph to, to during his campaign and also And also his motto, Brazil above everything and God above all. He has several models that bring the tradition of this large religious corporation. And what's interesting is that Bolsonaro gets elected and he, he suffers an attempt on his life. And then he 
he is described as anointed and several leaders visit him in the hospital and say that he has been anointed by God. And then based on this entire platform and this hegemonic Pentecostal religious organization and Catholic organizations, he was raised a Catholic. So these three religious conglomerates are mobilized around his campaign in a very intense manner. So he's able to get elected based on a discourse of hate towards feminist movements, uh, diverse movements, diversity movements. And he uses this discourse of hating what's different and of the traditional Brazilian family, which is also used by the evangelical politicians in Brazil. And when he wins the election, it is a symbolic act, I would say, Mr. Magno Malta, a prominent pastor in Brazil is beside him and prays beside him. And unlike what has happened in Brazil up to then, when people win elections and there's a huge party, but when he wins the election, several pastors gathered around him to pray. And I just wanted to, to read the this some excerpt of this moment out loud. Lord, my father, we are thankful right now. It was a year of struggle with the people asking to protect them, talking about family, talking about the country and about taking care of our children and our elders, God in our lives and God in the life of our country. We are fighting against corruption. Magno Malta said this word, word facing everyone. This is a moment of joy, but God has done even more because this is a moment of celebration and of praise to the Lord. We thank the Lord twice because you didn't allow Jair Bolsonaro to die. And the expectation of the Brazilian people has been fulfilled. We would like to thank the doctors that took care of Bolsonaro, he's standing now and God gave him the victory. God gave him this victory. God will give him wisdom and understanding so that he can have time to repair and to undo all that was done and give better days and happy days to our Brazilian citizens. And it is your word, Lord, that, uh, that says that God is the one that anoints people and God has anointed Jair Messias Bolsonaro and he, henceforth he is the elected and, go, and God appointed president of all and he loves the country, he's a patriot, and we thank God for his election. And all of us here, friends, the humble people of Brazil who have raised this flag, and our elderly who prayed every day, so evangelic, evangelic Catholics, and this is a majority Christian country, and just highlighting a part of his speech. Thank God for making this man strong and for appointing him and taking care of him and fighting for his family, for his children and making us guardians of his life more than ever in this difficult moment in Brazil. And here we see the elements. I would like to call your attention to three important elements in theological terms. First of all, he says that Bolsonaro has been anointed, which is a long-standing tradition of Brazilian Pentecostal churches, this anointment and bringing us the imagery of a king. So he's using a theological tradition to reinforce the Bolsonaro's jargon. And another theological tradition, first of all, it's important to say Pentecostalism, and the second important jargon is 
the election, which is a very specific tradition in Brazilian Pentecostals and Presbyterians saying that election is an important jargon because people are, were elected ever since the creation of the world to reach certain, to fulfill certain roles. So, and the third element is a strong man, uh, a man that watches over all, which is also an important tradition that is formative to Brazil in Christianism, and it is a theological tradition that is typical to ultra-conservative Catholicism. And what I mean by this, I don't know if I have any more time. I think I went over, I have five minutes. I just wanted to read three materials to close my initial idea. So we have just reinforcing these statements in August of 2020, so, I'm sorry, Silas Malafaia, a Brazilian pastor, when talking about his relationship with politics in August of 2020, he said this about Bolsonaro, we're friends, we're friends outside of politics. In politics, we have a few disagreements, but we can't deny that he's a good man for the nation. He's someone that was actually anointed by God to take this office and to lead the nation to truly better days. So in addition to Bolsonaro calling himself this man who was anointed, several religious congregations reinforced this and rallied behind him to, and the second element of the Christian theology is the traditional Protestantism. I will mention Pastor Junior, who is the First Lady's pastor. He also said when talking to Eduardo Bolsonaro in a live, I participate in politics as a citizen, and that's why I support Bolsonaro, because in his campaign, he says exactly what we believe in about the family and about the nation. And I visited him in the hospital and I actually realized how much he was elected and appointed by God to lead this nation. So this second tradition of the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the third theological and the third theological tradition, Father Paulo Ricardo, who is a conservative religious leader in Brazil, in an article in the beginning of the pandemic, he says that Jesus Christ, the King, abiding by all of the demands of his subjects, may be able to lead our president who was elected with his blessing to the altar and that he doesn't need to pay heed to anyone who speaks contrarily to him because God has appointed him. So, I've been trying to, to show and, and configure this. I disagree with uh, theological uh, theologist, uh, religious theologist that says Bolsonaro is a theologist. I would say he's not. I would say that behind him, he has a mixture of Christian traditions that are mobilized around and, and up, uphold his authoritative stance and his and his government and provide and which provide him with the religious tools to and strengthen to strengthen his government and this government needs a lot of strength because it is taking away food from poor people and is diminishing social policies and and promoting this respect towards diversity and it's really discriminatory discriminatory towards indigenous indigenous people and quilombo people and especially the landless movements that are so democratic 
So what I mean is, we are living through the, this plan that was structured from the military, uh, from the military dictatorship. And dictatorship doesn't mean being fascist, but what I mean is that the Bolsonaro government, it has direct fa fascist uh, characteristics because he's preoccupied with, and here I am based by Francisco Carlos Teixeira when he says that fascism in its first wave in the 30s and 40s in Europe, when it gathered a state around a person, it, the state starts to operate in the in this differentiated manner. And it has several national mobilizations and fascism is a way of implementing new economic circuit circuits. So new liberalism needed this fascist characteristics to introduce its economic model. So we have this marriage between hegemonic Christianism and fascism as a way of operating politically the economic strategy. So that's what I think is happening here as a version of a Christian fascism based on Christian instances in the big religious and Catholic and evangelical organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. You know, what you have mentioned brings a lot of anguish to us, but to hear that from someone who's researching, this is quite scary, if I may, the instrumentalization of the discourse and symbols and appropriation of religious symbolisms in this political pact of uh, or power that has affected us. Uh, so very much. We have many comments here. Your, uh, your lecture, and uh, it, it brings a lot of anguish, but we'll certainly uh, look into that in the few minutes of debate we have. And at this moment, I'd like to bring the reaction of our international guest. I'd like to welcome him again to Edgar Ato Sanchez Mendonça graduated in economy of cooperation by the University of Margo in political science and masters in sociology by the University of Costa Rica. Currently, Edgar is the one responsible for the instrument of three corporations towards the facilitation of co corporations between uh, South America, uh, Chile and the others. So welcome, thank you for being with us uh, since the very first floor, and I'd we'd like to hear you as well. Thank you very much.
como todo aquel espacio que permite la posibilidad para posicionar, reforzar o reproducir relatos significantes. Y de estos se derivan narrativas dogmáticas en materia de derechos e identificación de valores. Ilustraciones más allá del templo físico son las escuelas, las radios, las emisoras, los canales de televisión, las universidades, los emporios empresariales utilizados para reproducir esos relatos, esos discursos significantes y sobre todo una militancia que hasta entonces o que hoy día eh, tiene muchas características diferentes a las previas. Incluso para estratos sociales diferentes se producen significados también diferentes. El mercado en esta asociación podríamos visualizarlo en la asociación estrato, segmento, grupo social o grupo al que se interpela. En el nivel de la política ubicamos el poder del discurso, el poder de la narrativa y el poder de las respuestas inmediatas a necesidades, a las primarias, a las secundarias, a las terciarias o de otro orden. El poder para situar derechos o deberes, para movilizar o desmovilizar creencias y militancias. Por eso estamos en presencia de proyectos de poder en el cual efectivamente confluyen narrativas y relatos de carácter fundamentalista. Con una fuerte primacía del individuo por encima de lo social, con una fuerte primacía de lo paliativo o de lo caritativo por encima de cualquier transformación de las relaciones entre nosotros y nosotras como seres humanos, entre nosotras y nosotras y el medio que nos rodea, entre nosotros y el entendimiento de los bienes naturales como recursos para la mercantilización. Por eso usualmente en las lecturas fundamentalistas de estos relatos, el medio y los recursos a nuestro alrededor, tierra, por ejemplo, trabajo, capital, aparecen para ser aprovechados, maximizados y transformados en mercancía. En principio, todo aquello que entorpezca esta finalidad, hay que quitarlo, porque se trata de una distorsión. Estamos entonces en presencia de la apelación deliberada a valores individuales, libertarios en el sentido mercantil, en el terreno de la maximización de utilidades en un contexto de un fuerte intervencionismo paralelo de mucho proteccionismo, de Mesías. ¿No es esto una gran contradicción? Desde el punto de vista institucional, sin embargo, la vigencia de estas apuestas y de estos relatos fundamentalistas que utilizan el templo en esa acepción, afirman a su vez estructuras de respuesta a problemas sociales primarios, de desigualdades o inequidades que aparecen como necesidades de paliación o como efectos no deseados del desarrollo. Por eso muchas veces se constituyen sin tanta dificultad manifestaciones congregacionales neopentecostales intituladas de iglesia y devienen al menos de manera temporal en instancias que complementan o compiten en el ámbito de la cobertura de necesidades básicas que muchas veces las iglesias de carácter histórico no cubren, y de ahí su éxito. Esto es válido, sin embargo, también para estratos altos, interpelados en función de respuestas a otro tipo de necesidades. También lo vemos en todos aquellos grupos que buscan este tipo de relatos para afirmar sus valores. La pregunta básica en este contexto es, ¿y cuál es nuestra oferta? La oferta de las iglesias históricas, 
porque esta creación de militancia fundada en este tipo de valores no va a desaparecer y evidentemente utiliza el quiebre de la hegemonía de la Iglesia Católica en toda América Latina, de la Iglesia Católica tradicional, heredada. Se apela muchas veces a aquel versículo de Santiago o de Tiago, del capítulo 2, donde se habla de fe y de obras, y se plantea que la fe sin obras es muerta. Viendo las estadísticas que están disponibles por todos lados y situando más allá de Brasil esta situación, eh, tenemos mucho por lo que preocuparnos y mucho para la que ofrecer respuestas. En eso estamos. Gracias. Gracias, Edgar. Agradecemos mucho la presencia de Pão para el Mundo. Quiero agradecer la presencia de Pão para el Mundo esta mañana. On your behalf, for to the world that moves with us, it is a cooperation agency that we have here. And for a while, Brazil is acting within Brazil. Uh, he acts in Brazil, and he knows our reality. And we're quite thankful for the world. Well, we have many comments. We have um, many questions that, unfortunately, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through all of them. We have four minutes to close our seminar, but. You, you know, we can't leave so many questions without answers. So this floor here, this panel here, uh, brought a lot of reflection and anguish. So, and this was our intention to provoke all of you. Um, so right now I'd like to bring first and foremost two questions. And then with that, uh, uh, we'll see two others. Well, a question for both. What is the role of Masons, of the Freemasons in the fundamentalist? Uh, arrangement and another how do you see the universal church defending the family if they do if they defend the abortion I mean how uh, if the family is so important why they do not move abortion uh, onwards well we must have studies and researches that are more intensive on the role of masonry or the Freemasons in this process. It is ever present. And there are many uh, leaders identified as Masons, even among the military, uh, the, the evangelical uh, military men. So the, the history of churches in Brazil, this is a group that is articulate, that has influenced politically and is ever present in churches. But I believe we need more research. This group is there, it, it exists, it has a role. Um, but we need to research more. Regarding the second question, the, the, the universal church of the kingdom of the Lord, I-U-R-D, who are we talking about? Because it is a quite complex church. We have the heads of the hierarchy of the church, but we they also, they work with the franchise system. So, the churches that are in their churches, they are in places, they, they are a branch, they're a franchise. They're, so they have this, they pay for the use of the brand. So it is franchise, uh, true franchise. This is happening by Assembly of God. Is the, the market system acting within the Assembly of God? Well, it became a brand. So when we talk about the universal church, we need to uh, reason who we're talking about. So if we're talking about the hierarchy that leads processes in Eji Macedo in his theology, the family of Eji Macedo, there's a, his daughter and his son-in-law, they're great influence there, especially under family, marriage, and um, other leaderships in the Assembly of God who are in the in the situation of political power, we may state that this is valid for other uh, neo-Pentecostal groups. These 
church groups that are in the politics where there's a saying that says they dance according to song to the song so they will take on the discourse that is in power and uh, and they're gaining views so you can see in the news that this has been weakened there are groups criticizing the the bolsonaro administration their meetings uh, gathered in parallel for them to create a, an opposition front and people from the very universal uh, church is there so we must have first and foremost the understanding that when we talk about the evangelical in even of this or that church, we're not talking ab about a single block. We must think who we're talking about and to observe the behavior of these groups that they have the project of power, they have the thirst for influence, and they will play the game according to the ones that are in power. So you? Oh, yes, Fabi, por favor. Well, I'll take on what Magali, I will echo what Magali has mentioned, but I'd like just to just to try. When we talk about masonry, masonry or the Freemasons, well, I'll, I'll ask a question. Can you talk about Protestantism without talking about masonry in Brazil? So there, you know, they are faithful, they are funders of the expansion of the Protestantism of the Evangelical in Brazil. So there is this whole uh, issue about that, that, and some things must be seen, some, some things must be studied, as Magali has mentioned. But I want to highlight a very important element. I study the Baptist Church for a while, for a long time now, and I see the Baptist Church before the dictatorship, before the coup, the civil, uh, the civil uh, business and military coup. So a great uh, group of supporters to this coup. Before the coup, the, the leadership of the Baptist Church, church in Brazil and in, in São Paulo, in Rio, the leaderships, they were transforming and the masonry, masonry came back to this instance of this church, uh, taking the deaconships. So, and then the, the influence, the, the election of, of pastors during the, the, military, the military dictatorship. Well, all of this needs to be studied further in a more direct way. This plan, this construction is important uh, and the importance of masonry the, the traditions must be highlighted. And at the same time, the Bolsonaro administration, when he, goes, when he goes to a city in Rio, he has always to visit some stores. So it is important to notice that there is a whole, uh, or the, I, I mean, the lodge, the Mason uh, lodges. And so it is important to see the influence of masonry. The first, this is the first element that I like to bring. Masonry is a space of dispute and back in the past has helped the construction of the military dictatorship and Masons uh, helped uh, Bolsonaro. The second point that I don't recall, uh, Sonia, if you could repeat that, please. Yes, of course. Uh, do you see uh, you're hand in hand with the evangelicals defending the family? if they defend abortion. Why is this important theme is not taken into consideration? So I agree with Magali, the universal church is one of the most, uh, with different branches and tentacles in the, the Brazilian social life. For instance, in Africa, it helped the, the, the condoms being uh, used and diffused uh, in, the, the, in one of the, our, the justification was the health uh, discussion when they arrived in Africa and they supported the distribution of condoms to one third of the population in South Africa, in Soweto and other communities in the lower 
tiers so of the population so it is hard to to draw a line of universal church what i can say honestly about them is that it's very hard for them not to be in the in power in brazil i must say that the universal church has bent the knee and kissed the hand of uh, fernando henrique color and then lula with the all uh, Labour Party project, and also the same with Bolsonaro, and I believe that it's very hard for them not to have a project. And I'm being pragmatic here. In Project 2022, there is no uh, signature, no stamp of the Universal Church, as they are the owners of a great corporation, and media corporation, which is the Record uh, TV station. That's what I have to say about that. Para Magali, Fábio, o crescimento dos For grupos. Magali, é... the growth of evangelical groups and neo-pentecostal groups must be uh, aiming at the future. Is there, uh, there? Do you believe the growth is going to continue? How do you see as necessary steps to recommunicate the central values of the uh, of the gospel to Christians? Can we revert what happened politically? Is there a way forward? Well. On that, I invite you to read, and it was quite shared, uh, the link of the ebook with the, with the research. And at the end, we present possible strategies uh, for a response. And one thing that was quite strongly presented in the interviews that we have had with activists in the different movements and churches and fora, in church fora, is the need of understanding the universe of the people who embrace the proposals that come from these fundamentalist groups. So what happens for the success of this reality that I have described here? Many say that, well, it is brainwash. No, it's not. There is an appeal and there's a response. We're talking about things that people like to hear, they want to hear with a language that is accessible to these people. So one of the ideas that have been set forth in the survey is the need of going back to work at the basis, with the basis, and not for the basis, but with them, empowering them, also listening the people in their needs, in their in the necessities, in learning their language and the work with emotion, one of the the criticisms we hear in the research and we talk about self-criticism of the progressist movements and the left-wing movements is that they are too intellectualized working with a language that is too rational and and not with a lot of emotion they come with ideas but not with his, not with stories that touches the life that touch the lives of people and with that the groups that we call the fundamental fundamentalists well they do quite well they work with a story with emotion and it is necessary therefore to go back to the basis and start working with a critical thinking of this basis but with a language process with communication and the return to the the pastors of the Bible with the, the religious language, the mystical language that touches the lives of people. And I'm this, I'm not coming from it's not coming from my head. It's the result of the the survey which I agree upon. This is the the path we need. The people from the landless movement they have insisted with the work within the evangelicals who are in within the movement. Uh, there are many in the need that the landless movement. Uh, has been learning with them that embraces the engagement of the cause, the land cause, from their faith. And one is that. One are the Pentecostal people and the, the more conservative religiously. Are we going to call them fundamentalists? But they're there in the fight for the land and the causes and the, the rights. So we must learn from this experience. It is a humbling process. We need a lot of humbleness. I I work in Campo, at Campos Rio, and I have this work of a uh, of insertion uh, in the maroon population of Zumbi dos Palmares in Campos de Gota, dos Goitacazes, and I believe it's quite curious that because we talk about the 
where the intellectuality, the intellectuality talks about uh, this and that. But when, when we go to the Maroon uh, settlement, the largest one in Rio, the Catholic Church, the former Catholic Church, actually, of the São João plant, well, it's there with some 30, 40 seats. But what happens is in the 25 years of the settlement, we had 13 Pentecostal communities in the middle of the settlement. So there's no other Protestantism and there is no other a gospel. Even the Baptist church, the Campelo, is in the Pentecostal church. The, it became the Baptist church after so many other denominations. So we I must say there is a wide reconstruction and annex in addition to the Pentecost the Pentecostalism in the popular uh, tiers of Brazil. And we must understand why that happens. I agree with Magali. When you must see what are the languages and the symbology and how this religion, what does it say to the daily lives of these people? And in the case of this Baron population is of people of fight, how this 25 years to build, how they build this 13 churches, how this Pentecostalism took over the settlement, the different expressions took over. And there you have from the Assembly of God, the largest one with 200 members but we have smaller ones there's a congregation of the universal church that talks about agrarian reform in this con in congregation so we must as magali say we, we must lose the prejudice see the pentecost the pentecostals they talk to the daily lives of people and uh was assembly of god and uh here in a slum in campus well i went to this community and there, there was a Bible school. They, the, the pastor was not, uh, they didn't like him anymore. So I was teaching them with the Bible. And a lady came and said, you know, my heart burns because God talks to me every day. I, I don't want this thing of sun, preaching, Sunday preach. I want to talk. I want to speak in behalf of the Lord. So it is a different logic. So, Motto wrote that about the new logic in the, within the reform, and please close the elitist uh, reformist church. That's not more. That's not interesting for the Brazilian reforms anymore. And to widen the values, the charisma. So this is an important uh, fight for us to 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 fight and to see how important those different reforms are are, and uh, to understand that the the strength of the reform is the the peasant reform. The one that many times is forgotten by us. Uh, I'm not concerned with the, the temples, with the empty temples. No, don't don't be concerned with them. And it's uh, Miss Jacinta from the, the Assembly of God in Santa Rosa, in Campos de Goitacas, that said that. She says, "This in this way, God talks to me every day. And so we must learn how to deal with this different phenomena more and more the Pentecostal, they, they take over the different uh, denominations of churches, even the Lutherans. Well, everyone, we are going over our time. We will soon be closing our discussion. And just to conclude, I will make a reflection I will do like Marinez did in the first session. And we had so many interesting reflections in the chat box. And it really speaks to a phenomenon we have faced and really deserves an entirely new seminar, which is fake news. I agree that capitalism is interested in fundamentalism, but especially the big data and algorithm capitalism. There are many studies about the dissemination of fake news among Catholics and evangelicals to disseminate fundamentalist, authoritarian, and mind-controlling ideas. I would like to hear more about the relation of the new non-productive cap capitalisms like financial capitalism and current capitalism connected to big data. 
and this deserves an entirely new seminar to discuss this such a complex subject so i will conclude with that yes magali i will just make an intervention here i would invite you all to know about to get to know the berea collective which is a collective that was created by evangelical and catholic journalists that has worked to fight misinformation among religious people and i will share the link in the chat box yes of course magali it's very important that you remember the berea collective excellent well dear all did you i believe you all enjoyed the first day of our seminar the presence of Monique, SESI, FPFD, PH Brazil, the Humanitas Institute, Unistinos, CMBB, and the hashtag Respira Brazil. We have a supporters, ISE, PAG, CRB, Repan Brazil. We also have partnerships with the Resistentes Channel, the social movements platform for the reform of the so political system. So this entire group of organizations dreamed and actually realized this seminary, the seminar, and we are very happy about this first morning and all the interventions. And we want to invite you to be here with us tomorrow at 10, when we will open our first round of discussions, human and social rights, aggravated inequality with our friend Benilda Brilton. We will have the companion Ailton Krenaki and as international guests, Marie, Bruno Marie Dufé and Cristine Ange Yuji Castello. And it will be mediated by Professor Raimundo Cesar Barreto Jr. And, our, and in our fourth session from 11.30 to 12.30, Luis Marquez, Nara Baré, and as an international guest, Josiane Gautier, and mediated by our dear Moema Miranda. So today was just a taste of our discussions, and we're now curious to participate in the rest of the seminar, and tomorrow we have more. So we expect all of you and thank you for being with us, 150 people with us just in the Zoom webinar. So thank you very much, Magali, Fabio, Edgar. And Homi is asking to speak because I must have forgotten something. No, you didn't. But just to say that this morning, because of requests, we have reopened the the platform for the people who want to register for the webinar. And this can be done, will be able to be done up until tomorrow. Yes, you can register until tomorrow. So if you want to, you can go to the, to the Avring platform. And tomorrow morning, I will send the link. And it's the same link as today. So we say goodbye with a big hug, a big online hug, and we wish you a great afternoon with a lot of reflections after this wonderful morning. Thank you, everybody.